Uh, so we've got two more talks before we have afternoon tea. Uh, and the first one is we've got Dustin Whittle here. Uh, Dustin is a developer evangelist at uh, AppDynamics. Uh, where he helps businesses uh, foco uh, focus on their uh, application performance and things like that. He's worked at several other, uh, several other companies much in the same field, uh, such as uh, Sensio Labs and Yahoo. Uh, when Dustin, yeah, when, when he's not working, some of the other things he likes doing is flying. Fly, are you a pilot? Cool. Cessna? Yeah. 182s? Yeah, well, it depends, yeah. Nice. 182s. Yeah, I've flown a couple. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Can we just talk about flying for the next hour? That would be fun. Uh, sailing, diving, golfing, and traveling around the world, which is a pretty sweet sort of setup. So uh, without further ado, Dustin, the floor's yours. Thank you very much. So this talk is really about uh, performance testing. Uh, most applications and most companies, uh, they don't think of performance as a feature. They think of it as a nice to have. Most companies don't really evaluate performance until they go live or even after they've gone live. So the performance of your application uh, affects your businesses more than you might think. Uh, countless studies have gone into uh, how the end user experience is impacted by the application performance. So again, my name is Dustin Little. You can find out more about me at DustinWhittle.com or follow me on Twitter. I tend to do talks at warp speed, so if you want me to slow down, just let me know. Um, I've worked at a variety of companies in the past, um, including today I currently work as a developer evangelist at AppDynamics. Previous to that, I was a consultant and trainer for Sensu Labs, the company behind the Symphony framework in Silex. And then previous to that, I brought Symphony to Yahoo to rebuild properties like Delicious and Yahoo Answers on Symphony. So I'd like to start with uh, why does performance matter? So Microsoft found that Bing searches that were two seconds slower resulted in a 4.3% drop in revenue per user. And when Mozilla shaved 2.2 seconds off their landing page experience, Firefox downloads increased 15.4%. So they got 60 million more downloads simply because the page was that much faster. And then making Barack Obama's website 60% faster increased donation conversions by 14%. But the most impactful statistic that I've come across is that Amazon and Walmart e-commerce front ends increase their revenue by 1% for every 100 milliseconds that they shave off the end user experience time. And it's not just these companies. All the leading tech companies realize that performance directly impacts their revenue, so they really treat performance as a feature. So from AOL to Amazon to Yahoo and Mozilla, uh, Shopzilla, every company really understands the value of performance. And ultimately it comes down to performance directly impacts the business's bottom line. Now I know I'm talking to a room full of engineers, but uh, really you should focus on the business impact of the code that you write because that's the real value that it has to the company. The question really is how fast is fast enough? How does your brain perceive page load times? 100 milliseconds, it feels instantaneous. It feels like you're flipping a page in a book. You can keep the context of what you were thinking. One second, you can still think seamlessly, but it's proven that after about three seconds, users start to abandon. And after 10 seconds, they completely abandon your application. And I think everyone has had this experience. If you've ever been in a checkout, an e-commerce checkout application and you click checkout and it just waits for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, you often want to just click. But the engineer inside of us all knows that you just wait it out. Now, it's not just enough to be fast, but you also have to be available. So it's not just about performance, but it's also about scale. And the most shining use case that I've seen of failure is really when they launch healthcare.gov. So the US launched healthcare.gov to offer insurance to all the Americans that don't have it. Uh, the problem was when they launched a the site, it instantly fell over. And this is the first time I've seen a president go on live TV and apologize for a broken, busted application. So the core of it is treat performance as a feature. Now I'm gonna go through a bunch of different tools to load test applications, both on the server side and also understand client side performance. So let's start with an example application on how to test performance. Because I'm a big Symphony fan, uh, I like to use the Symphony Hello World edition that's sort of optimized for this benchmark. You can easily get started on GitHub, just git clone symphony slash symphony dash hello world. That comes with a script that allows you to simply optimize and then you can uh, run it on local hosts. Now the reality is uh, you don't want to test in dev environments, you really want to test in a staging or production environment, but this is a quick and easy way to test some of the tools that I'm going to talk about. So again, it's quite simple, traditional hello world application, very robust. Okay, so tools of the trade for performance testing. The first thing I like to focus on is understanding your baseline performance. Understand, based on a certain hardware spec, this is the performance that you can spec out of Nginx and PHP FPM. You can do that for a static page, so what can Nginx handle when it's not passing it off to PHP FPM? So what can this hardware spec handle? And then the hello world. I like to test hello world in the framework because it lets you understand the overhead that your framework provides. So oftentimes, full stack frameworks like Symfony and Laravel and a bunch of others, they provide a ton of features, but those features come at a cost of overhead. 
So it's good to understand the, the relative cost of your framework. And then you should test your application. So I like to run three sets of load tests. Uh, when I start load testing a simple application, it's run a static file, so just Nginx serving a static file to understand maximum concurrency. Then add some application logic into it, so let PHP process the request in a very simple form, so understand PHP's peak concurrency. Something like Hello World works very well for this. And then understand your application overhead in, in your, inside your framework. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is Apache Bench. Apache Bench ships with, uh, if you've installed Apache 2, you automatically have access to Apache Bench, and it's an extremely easy tool to get started with load testing your applications. So as a quick example, you can simply run AB, so AB is the Apache Bench command, with a concurrency of one for a time of 10 seconds, and dash K is a benchmark mode, so no delay between the request. And what this will tell you is if I send as many requests as I can with a single con uh, level of one concurrency for 10 seconds, how many, what's the average response time, and what's the maximum number of concurrent requests? Now, we're artificially handicapping the level of concurrency just to get a baseline on the average latency. So what you can see is that when we load test this application, we can get 18 requests a second, it's very impressive with a time per request of 53 milliseconds. So the average latency is 53 milliseconds and I can, this server can handle 18 requests a second at a single, a single user. But that's not very often that valuable. So really what you want to figure out is what's the maximum concurrency uh, that this server can handle and at what point does the latency start to skyrocket as your uh, concurrency goes up? Because you need to find the happy medium where you can offer uh, the lowest latency with the maximum concurrency because you can always send, handle more traffic, the, everything's just gonna take one second or two seconds. So you need to be cognizant of that. So the next step is really increase the concurrency. So this is the exact same command, except for instead of a concurrency of one, we're gonna change it to a concurrency of 10. So here we have Apache Bench with a concurrency of 10 concurrent HTTP requests for 10 seconds. So these are obviously just examples because 10 seconds is really not enough to load test your application and 10 users every, every app should be able to support. So what you'll get is a very similar output, except for this time the time per request is 151 milliseconds and we can handle uh, 65 requests per second. Now Apache Bench is quick and dirty, it's available on pretty much every platform, so it's very easy to just get started if you wanna understand the basic performance of your application. Uh, this works well for a single page, for a single endpoint. But I'm a bigger fan of Siege. Siege is a, another simple uh, HTTP performance testing tool. And what they do is it allows you to run the same things we did earlier with Apache Bench. We're gonna run with the siege command. So you can app get install siege very easily. So siege dash C, again, concurrency of 10. Dash B is benchmark mode, so there's no delay between the request. And then we wanna run the test for 10 seconds. We're gonna get a very similar output as we got earlier. It should be pretty consistent. In this case, we get 65 transactions a second uh, with the average latency of about 100 milliseconds. Somewhere in there. Okay. So that's fine when you want to just load test your home page, and it's a fairly static site. It's relatively easy to do. But most applications, you don't just want to load test the home page because for each different HTTP transaction, there's different performance characteristics. So your home page is likely going to be highly cached, so it's extremely fast. But if you want to understand how many concurrent checkout users you have, you need to be able to script, to script that scenario and maintain state. So Another problem that you find is how do you discover all the URLs in your application? So if you're using Symfony, you can just dump the router and dump the entire URL map, but most frameworks don't have this feature. So you need to automatically discover all of your URLs. So I found a neat trick to be able to do this very easily by emulating a search engine spider to go to the home page, recursively call, crawl all of the links, and then come up with a unique list of URLs for your application. So not, that way I don't just have the home page, I have a belt, uh, login, logout, checkout, et cetera. So in order to do that, we're gonna use a tool called sProxy. sProxy is made by the people who make Siege, and all it is is a transparent HTTP proxy. So when I make a request to your site, I'm gonna proxy it through sProxy, and it's gonna record the URL. So all you do to do that is run sProxy, and I wanna output the URLs to urls.txt. Uh, sProxy will be running on port 9001. It's gonna dump the urls.txt, and then it's gonna have a timeout of 120 seconds. Now this is a bit convoluted of a command, uh, but the idea here is that all you really want to do is run wget in spider mode and pass it through sProxy. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. So wget is another uh, Linux tool that you can use. Uh, simply app get install wget. It's available on most platforms. Uh, so wget dash dash spider dash r 
uh, the level of uh, recursion that we want, and then we're going to pass in the HTTP proxy. So in this case, we're running S proxy on localhost port 9001, and all we want to do is have wget crawl the entire site for a logged out experience and generate a list of unique URLs. So that's what we'll do here. We'll run wget, that'll create this urls.txt file, and then we just want to sort a list of unique URLs. And what you end up with is an easy way to have all the URLs of your application in one text file so that you can start load testing each endpoint. So again, this is an example e-commerce app that's built on the uh, Silex, yeah, Silius, Silus, something like this, e PHP e-commerce platform. Uh, and the idea here is that I have a belt, I can view my cart, I can change my concurrency, I can log in, register for a new account, I can view products by a tag or category in terms of service, so static content. But this allows you to really understand all the functionality that your application provides, so you can start load testing each endpoint to understand the relative performance. Because it's not just enough to load test the home page, you really need to load test the actual functionality of the application. So here we can benchmark traffic across all the unique URLs with Siege. So it's very easy to do with Siege. You can simply just pass in the urls.txt as a file. So here we're going to run Siege with a, this time a concurrency of 50 for three minutes with urls.txt and a depth of 10. And sadly, there's a slide missing there. Uh, but the idea here is that you'll get a dump of all the URLs and the relative performance of each one. Now, all of these tools are pretty straightforward. They're available on Linux and most platforms. If you're uh, more of a visual person, I highly recommend Apache JMeter. Uh, it's written in Java. It's much more of a visual tool so that you can very easily graph out a load test and just add new URLs. So I prefer to write code. I prefer not to use GUIs. Um, so we're going to dive into another tool called Multi-Mechanize. So you'll notice that most of the tools I'm talking about are not written in PHP. Um, the, this talk is not specific to PHP applications. You can use these techniques to load test any application. So Multi-Mechanize is a Python framework for, open, uh, for performance and load testing. And the reason Multi-Mechanize is really useful is it allows you to maintain state between request and script user scenarios. So I want to test uh, creating an account and I want, to, I want to load test that endpoint. I want to load test being able to add something to a cart and then checking out. So we'll walk through a couple example scenarios. So it's very easy to install. If you're familiar with Python, you can just pip install multi-mechanize. And then you have a command line with multi-mech new projects. So it'll just bootstrap a new load testing project where you can start scripting your user scenarios. At the heart of multi-mechanize, you have a transaction. The only thing that multi-mechanize cares about is you describe a transaction. So this is some Python code that uses the HTTP request library. So request is like guzzle, but for Python. And all I want to do is make a request to acmedemoapp.com and read the response and time it. And then I want to be able to run that at high levels of concurrency. So we can do that with Apache Bench. But oftentimes, you want to have something more advanced. Like I want to go to the home page and then go to the cart. So the nice thing about multi-mechanize is that because you have this generic transaction, you can do whatever you want inside the transaction, and it'll run that at high levels of concurrency. So let's take a look at this. So again, this is Python code. All we're going to do is import multi-mechanize. Uh, mechanize comes with a browser that will maintain your state, so it'll maintain your cookies. So if you log in, it'll pass that data to the next request, so you can actually have a logged-in experience. So Mechanize comes with this browser. We're just going to disable the robots so it doesn't um, deny the request. And then we're going to use a timing library to create custom timers for each request. The nice thing about Multi-Mechanize is it generates a bunch of fancy graphs uh, that allow you to understand the latency at various levels of concurrency. So in this case, we want to create two timers, one for the home page and one for the cart. And in this case, we're just going to create a start time, open up acmedemoapp.com, read the response, and then subtract the difference, and that's our latency. Uh, they have a custom timers API, so all we need to do is store the latency for each request here, and it'll automatically graph this out based on this custom timer. And then we can do the same thing. So this is a dead simple example. All we're going to do is go to acmedemoapp.com and then go to, to acmedemoapp.com slash cart and do the same thing. And we want to just understand the latency of each one of these endpoints. Uh, it also has some assertions, so you can actually test that you're getting valid requests. I get an HTTP 200 response. I had this in the title, et cetera. Uh, but I'm not really focusing on that right now. Uh, Multi-Mechanize has a really simple configuration system. All you want to say is, what's the runtime? So I want to run this for 10 seconds. And I want to ramp up the request over five seconds. So I can either send as many requests as I can immediately, or I can ramp them up over time. One thing that Multi-Mechanize does very well is it'll always send a cache request. So it'll always send a single request to prime the cache, and then it'll start load testing. 
because you don't, you don't want your results to be skewed by the first request, in which most frameworks do a bunch of configuration and caching up front. Once you've done this, uh, you can create as many of these scenarios as you'd like. So here we just have this scenario, but we could have a login scenario, an add to cart and checkout scenario. Um, if you're writing blog posts, submit a blog post, et cetera. As many as, as makes sense for your application. And then we can run multi-mech run demo, and it'll run the load test for the, the time specified, and generate some fancy graphs. So it'll generate several pages of these for each endpoint. And what it'll tell you is the response time plotted over the level of concurrency. So you can quickly understand for each custom timer, um, as you increase the concurrency, how does that affect the response time? Now this is fine when you have a simple application, when you, when you want to just load test a single server. But the reality is most applications have multiple servers behind it. By a show of hands, how many of you manage uh, an application that has multiple application servers? Right, so the reality is these tools are great when you want to just run it off a server inside of your data center or maybe off your MacBook connected to a LAN. Uh, but what happens when you need more than one machine? If you want to load test a highly complex distributed application that has a thousand app servers, you're never going to be able to generate that sort of load and concurrency off of a single machine. So who lives in the cloud? Who uses something like Amazon Web Services, Heroku, Engine Yard, et cetera, et cetera? So this is my favorite tool to talk about. Uh, one, because it has an amazing logo and an even more impressive title. So we're going to be talking about bees with machine guns, which is amazing. So what is bees with machine guns? It's a utility for arming many bees to attack targets, where arming is creating micro EC2 instances in Amazon Web Services to load test web applications. So this is a really easy way to do distributed, uh, web, uh, distributed load test. This is also the only tool that I know that comes with a warning that this is a felony to use against any other site but your own, because essentially it's a distributed denial of service attack. I was gonna use a live example where I take down the tourist site, but I had a conversation last night and I was told that probably isn't a good idea. So again, this is written in Python. It's very easy to configure. If you're not familiar with Amazon Web Services, you can get a free account for up to a year. So it's completely free to spin up a bunch of instances and try to load test your applications. So again, it's in Python, so the installation is extremely simple. Simply pimp, pip install bees with machine guns. Pretty straightforward. Now, bees with machine guns relies on a Python library called Bodo that just provides access to Amazon Web Services. And the only thing you really need to do is sign up for an Amazon account and then configure your access key in secret inside this configuration file. And then if you want, you can specify the region that you want to run your load tests from. In this case, I'm just going to run them from Oregon, which is uh, AWS's US West 2 data center. Um, and the idea here is I just want to spin up many instances, uh, many EC2 instances concurrently, and then have them all generate traffic for a particular URL endpoint. In order to do that, they have a bees command that is, becomes available when you pip install bees with machine guns. All we're going to do here, it looks very complex, but the only, only thing you need to know is bees up and then dash s2. So I want to spin up two servers using the default security group with this AMI, with this SSH key, and I want to log in with this SSH user. So you can omit most of this except for the bees up and the number of servers that you want to spin up. So these guys are sort of hilarious because they have uh, some very crafty output. They're going to connect to the hive, attempt to call up two bees, wait for the bees to load their machine guns, and when the bees are ready to attack, they'll let you know that the swarm has assembled the bees. So you can call bees report. That'll just let you know what's in the roster, how many servers are up and available for load testing. And all this is going to do is say, hey, we spun up these two EC2 instances at these IPs. And when I want to start load testing at higher levels of concurrency, I can generate 1,000 concurrent requests off my MacBook with a fast internet connection. But if you want to generate 20,000 or 50,000 or even 100,000 or a million, you're going to need to spin up multiple instances. So in that case, we're simply going to add instances to this, as many as we want, and then we can call bees attack. So bees attack, I'm going to start this with a low level of concurrency. So here we're going to run 1,000 requests at a concurrency of 50 uh, concurrent requests against acmedemoapp.com. And that's going to load test 50 concurrent users. This is just a demo example. So it's going to read two bees from the roster, connect to the hive, assemble the bees. Each of the two bees will fire 500 rounds, 25 at a time. And it's going to sting the URL so it's cached for the attack. So just like multi-mechanize, it'll automatically send one request to prime the cache. And then it'll start the load test. And then you get an aggregate summary of the, the performance results. So in this case, now we can, because we're spinning up uh, level 50 of concurrency, we can support 306 requests per second with an average response time of 163 milliseconds. 
And the mission assessment is that the target crushed the bee offensive and the swarm is awaiting new orders. Now, what happens when you want to really saturate this? You can simply increase the level of concurrency. So I went from 50 now to 1,000. Ah, there we go. Okay, so we're going to call bees attack. This time, we're going to run 100,000 requests with a level of concurrency of 1,000. So we're going to send 1,000 concurrent requests until we hit 100,000 requests uh, for acmedemoapp.com. And this time, we're going to get a similar output. It's going to say, hey, we completed 100,000 requests. This time, the request per second, we've managed to hit 502 uh, requests per second. But the average response time has gone up to 360 milliseconds. So what we see is we've already started to saturate our application servers. And again, the mission assessment is the target crush to be offensive. OK, now when you run into errors, uh, they, again, just I love the output of these, that's just, which is why I include it. Uh, whenever a bee fails to attempt, it's going to say, no bees completed the mission. Apparently, your bees are peace-loving hippies. All right, now the, the deal with the cloud is that costs scale linearly with demand. So you, you pay for whatever you use. So you want to be able to make sure you tear down these instances as soon as you're done. Using EC2 and on-demand instances, or really any cloud platform where you can spin up instances very quick, is great for load tests. Because oftentimes, I just want to spin up 50 servers for an hour, send a lot of traffic towards my application, and then tear them all down. You can do that extremely cheap in cloud environments. Uh, when you're done, you simply call bees down, and it'll shut off the EC2 instances, and you'll stop getting billed. So it's going to read the two from the roster, and then it'll send them down. Now, I'm a big fan of this next framework called Locus.io. So this is something relatively new to the performance testing scene. Uh, if you go to locus.io, uh, you can get started. Basically, it's a Python library that uh, builds off of multi mechanized provided originally. It allows you to do scripted user scenarios for load testing complex web applications. But even better is that just like you write a functional test, you can just write functional performance tests, and then you can just run these every release very easily. So this is a, I screenshotted right off the home page. It's very simple to write. All you do is describe a website task. On start, I simply want to make a request to log in to authenticate. And then I can make a request to slash git, slash about, and you can add as many of these as you want. It makes it extremely easy to, uh, to test very complex applications in a reproducible fashion. Um, even better is it comes with a great UI where you can trigger these tests from a, from a GUI, uh, a web application. And then you can also see the response data. So here you can run a load test for each one of these, see the number of requests currently, uh, the average response time, uh, and the number of requests per second that each one of these transactions can support. So if you want to load test every transaction in your application, this makes it very easy to describe all of the transactions. And this makes it very easy to get reporting on that in real time. You can write this once and then uh, integrate it with Jenkins or Travis CI so they get run every time you do a new build. So that's a crash course on the server side. But I think the, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the client side. Because the reality is that in modern web applications, more latency comes from the client side than the server side. The 200 milliseconds you're waiting for PHP to respond with your, your application content is nothing to the two seconds that you're waiting inside the browser to, under, uh, to download JavaScript and CSS and all the third-party assets, build the DOM, and paint the page, and make it actually usable. So let's talk about some quick tools for understanding client-side performance. So one is Google PageSpeed. I think most people are familiar with Yahoo's YSlow or the next generation of that, which became Google PageSpeed. Uh, it's a tool for analyzing and optimizing uh, the front end performance using best practices. So you're probably already familiar with common best practices for front end, like caching your CSS and JavaScript and using far futures expires headers so they don't download it every single request. What PageSpeed does is provides a bunch of rules and uh, calculates a score based on your website. So you can use Google PageSpeed in a variety of ways. Uh, one, it ships with an Nginx extension. So if you don't want to actually make any changes to your code, you can do all of this at runtime at the, at the web server. Uh, and it also has an extension for Apache as well. So this is a very easy, quick win where you can enable this module in Nginx or Apache and automatically get improved performance on the client side with zero effort on your uh, uh, zero development effort. They also have a website. So it's very easy to just throw in a URL and say, OK, um, I should minify my JavaScript, I should minify my CSS, and maybe I should use some HTTP caching headers for my static assets. They also have a Firefox uh, or, and Chrome extension. So here you can use the PageSpeed Chrome extension to do the same thing in line. This works well if you're having a local, uh, local site where you don't have it publicly available to the internet. And then finally, they have an API. So I'm a big fan. I'm very lazy. I like to do things once and then just automate it moving forward. So I, I like to leverage their API. All you need is a Google developer key, which is free. 
Uh, and then you can integrate this into your continuous integration setup. So most of the tools that I'm talking about, you know, the goal is really to write this stuff once and then make it part of your build and deployment process. This isn't something that you should only do at, uh, when you go to release the site. This is something that you should do every single time you do a deployment because you change the functionality which impacts performance. So the next one I'm going to talk about is WEvents. So a bit more granular on the client side is really understanding um, how much time are you spending doing uh, SSL negotiation, DNS lookups, um, you know, what are the slowest assets on your site. WBench makes it very easy to use a real version of Chrome. So it uses Chrome and Chrome Driver to be able to give you uh, granular insights into the client side performance. So this time we're going to be using a Ruby tool. So you can simply gem install WBench. And then you need to install Chrome Driver and you can simply run WBench and then the URL that you want to test. What this will do, it will spin up a Chrome instance, load the page, and then use the W3 navigation timing APIs and the resource timing APIs to give you a breakdown of exactly what's happening on the client side. So uh, W3C created a standard for tracking uh, client side timings and also resource timings more recently. So the idea here is I can figure out how much time am I spending doing DNS lookup, connecting to the server, um, waiting for assets to load, at what point I got the response back, at what point the DOM was interactive, and when I could start using the application itself. So this is a very easy tool to be able to understand what's happening on the client side automatically. So I'm going to skip through some of this because this talk is built for a longer format, but the, the goal here is that you should automate client side performance testing with Grunt or Gulp. I'm going to use Grunt, but if you're not familiar, you should be using Bower to manage your front end dependencies, Grunt, for, Grunt or Gulp for automation, and Uman for quickly bootstrapping applications with best practices built in. Now the reason I talk about Grunt is Grunt has a great uh, ecosystem of plugins. One of those plugins is Grunt PageSpeed. So Grunt is simply a JavaScript task manager um, that allows you to automate a lot of the server side tasks that you do. One of those could be performance testing. You can simply npm install Grunt PageSpeed and now you can automate exactly what I was just talking about for every time you do a new deploy or build. Okay. So how many people understand exactly how fast their site runs in production? Right. How many of you would call yourselves professionals who work for a reputable company? <laughs> All right, I feel like there's a disconnect between the two. The reality is a lot of people, most companies that I work with, I do a lot of performance consulting, um, and most companies that I, I work with, the way they find out about problems is somebody submits a ticket. If you're an e-commerce shop and somebody has to complain to you to find out that their checkout transaction is not working, your company is losing money, right? Um, that shouldn't be the first way, the first attempt to monitor performance. You should track performance in development and production. Of the companies that track performance, most of them only do it in production. But by the time you release a new build of production, it's too late. There's a lot of issues that you want to be proactive about fixing in your dev and staging environments before you get to production. So part of the reason you do performance testing is to figure out where you have bottlenecks. In order to find out where you have the bottlenecks, you really need to instrument all of your code. You should instrument your code, your databases, caches, queues, third-party services, and your infrastructure. Um, the reason uh, healthcare.gov failed originally was not just the front-end site. It was all the third-party dependencies that they relied on. When they went to try to use those dependencies at high levels of concurrency, everything failed, and the front-end didn't handle that well. So you should tr really try to instrument everything you can. So I'm a big fan of Chef. Uh, Chef and Sensu is a great combination. Uh, Chef allows you to describe your roles and the packages for each role. Sensu is an open source monitoring framework that makes it really easy to uh, monitor specific services and then pull stats and pass them off to something like StatsD or uh, Grafana and Graphite. So I'm going to sort of skip through some of this. But StatsD, Graphite, and Grafana are a great combination of open source tools that allow you to easily track metrics from every service that you use. So you can pull the number of open concurrent Nginx connections, the average response, uh, the average latency for talking to MySQL, the average latency for talking to third-party APIs. And it makes it really easy to build sexy dashboards like this in Grafana. So the reason you want this is when you run a load test, you don't just want to understand what's your peak level of concurrency. You want to understand what breaks and why. In order to do that, you have to have some instrumentation in place. So this is a Grafana dashboard. Uh, pretty much you can track anything you want. StatsD is just a generic backend for uh, tracking statistics, and Graphite is just a, a graphing library for time series data. So uh, if, you download the, if you check out the slides later, uh, there's a lot of details on how to set up all of these, but this talk isn't long enough to really dive into it deep. So the next thing is tracking the performance of end users. 
The reality is most performance problems don't manifest themselves until you're in production and you have a large sample size of users. Everything might be great if you're hosted in the west coast of the US and users are in California or based in the west coast, but all your users in Australia are going to be suffering just because of the network latency. So being able to get visibility into the real end user experience becomes very important. So there's a couple of different tools. There's Boomerang, there's Episodes. The goal of all of these is to be able to track the perceived page load time and then beacon that data back so you can understand um, how long pages are taking to load for real users. Because the different, there's a lot of things that can impact this. Not just the network latency, but which browser are you running? Um, which operating system, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes it very easy to track client-side timings. So Episodes is another framework that allows you to very easily tr track JavaScript timings and then beacon these back to your server. So I can capture on Chrome, on Mac, in Australia, when I loaded DustinWhittle.com, it took two seconds. But if I'm in the West Coast on the same device, it might take 100 milliseconds. Episodes is a granular API that makes it very easy to track uh, JavaScript timings as well. So those are some tools um, that you can just add, uh, add, to your, add to your stack to get understanding of performance on the server side and understanding on the client side. The next one I'm going to talk about is webpagetest.org. Webpagetest.org uh, is an open source project that a variety of uh, internet companies have collaborated on to make it very easy to test from different locations using different browsers under different network conditions. So it's a free tool. It makes it very easy to use. All you can do is go to webpagetest.org, pick a location. They have locations all around the world. Pick a particular browser so they support mobile devices as well. Um, the level, the number of tests that you run, want to run and then you can just start the test. And what it will do is it will tell you um, not only the uh, waterfall breakdown of what happened concurrently versus serially, but it'll also provide a video of the rendering so you can see how it renders in different browsers, as well as a screenshot for the final output. So it's also a good QA tool as well. But the reason I mention it is it gives you, again, uh, the client-side timing API so you can understand where you have uh, issues like concurrency and where you have miscellaneous redirects. So I steal the fav icon service from Google for my personal website, so I don't have to download all the fav icons. And the problem with that is it issues a bunch of redirects. So now I'm making two HTTP requests for every image that I want to download on my site, and this makes it very easy to see that. Okay, so sitespeed.io. Sitespeed.io allows you to analyze the performance of your website speed um, and really get, build out these custom dashboards. So it'll tell you things like what's the rule score. It's a, essentially a page speed score the average number of images per page, the average number of DNS lookups per page. And the reason this is really useful, if you integrate this into something like Jenkins, it becomes extremely easy to see what's changed between the, the various builds. Um, and then how you handle caching time. So this is stuff that's not always very apparent. Uh, this makes a great way to visualize this in a very easy at-a-glance dashboard. So the company that I work for is a company called AppDynamics. What we do is application performance management for a variety of web and mobile applications. Um, this isn't a plug for my company. It doesn't matter what tool you use. There's open source approaches to this. There's a variety of commercial approaches. But the goal is that you should be monitoring production performance. What tool you use is really up to you. Uh, there's a bunch of open source tools I'll talk about. Uh, but the idea here is to be able to understand the server side interactions and all the, your dependencies, like talking to databases and caches and queues, and then being able to understand the end user experience in real time. And they provide a breakdown of a bunch of stuff, and there's custom metrics. Now, um, there's New Relic, there's Dynatrace, there's AppDynamics. Uh, Twitter offers an open source tracing library called Zipkin. Uh, there's a variety of approaches. Um, it really doesn't matter, but you should be doing something to monitor performance. If you're finding out because a user submitted a ticket that you're failing, uh, you've already lost the battle. So one thing that you need to do is be able to actually turn this, this intelligence into useful actions. And one of the ways to do that is to learn how to profile code for PHP performance. So let's talk about Xdebug and WebGrind. So Xdebug is a debugger and profiler for PHP applications, and WebGrind is a front end for these profiles. Um, a more powerful version of this is KcacheGrind. If you're running on Linux, it's very easy to do. But the idea here is that you can simply install the Xdebug extension, uh, and then in your development environment, you can understand which PHP methods are getting invocated the most times, wh where you're having the most latency, et cetera. So you can find out more at webgrind.org and check out xdebug.org. The next up, uh, so the problem with xdebug and that approach is that um, there's a lot of latency. So this isn't, you don't want to run xdebug in production. It's great for your dev environments because it's a development profiler. Um, in this case, we're, let's talk about xhprof, which you can run in production, right? So Facebook developed a function level hierarchical profiler called xhprof, 
and XHProf GUI is sort of uh, the front end for that. Again, the same goal, it's a PHP extension that you can add to your production PHP applications. It'll automatically monitor performance, and then you can get visibility into which calls are being made the most and where the, your code is the slowest. So you can start to understand what code you should optimize uh, in production. Again, it's not just enough to do this in development because most of the times you don't see these performance problems until you'll have higher levels of data, higher levels of concurrency that only really manifest themselves in production. Um, and then there's also blackfire.io, which is a relative uh, new tool to the scene built by the people at Sensio Labs behind the Symphony framework. And it does something similar to XHProf, which will give you an understanding of your call graph and really where you're spending time on the server side. Now, all these are open source solutions that you can just plug into your project and get started with both performance testing and code profiling. But oftentimes, it's easier just to buy a service. So let's quickly talk about some load testing services that are available from the cloud. So I'm a big fan of Apica. Apica, while it's a bit expensive, um, allows you to load test from uh, at any level of concurrency. So you can send 2 million concurrent requests from all the locations around the world, and it makes it really easy to script. If you want to just get started with something dead simple, you can use blitz.io. Blitz.io is essentially Apache Bench in the cloud. It allows you to just select the level of concurrency, type in a URL, and press go, and get a response time uh, versus concurrency breakdown. And then there's BlazeMeter. So BlazeMeter is essentially Apache JMeter in the cloud. So this is useful for not only web applications, but also mobile applications if you want to load test databases and number of uh, instances you can fit in a queue, et cetera. So uh, I like to write everything myself. I prefer code, but sometimes it's not worth the engineering effort. Uh, it's worth just spending $100 and buying a service. So check them out. Now, a lot of people make the mistake of not testing for failures. Uh, Netflix released uh, the, a suite of tools called the Simeon Army. One of those tools is called Chaos Monkey. Uh, what it does is it emulates failures inside of uh, the AWS Amazon Web Services environment. And the reason this is important is I've suffered some humiliating failures in production uh, because of stupid things that I just didn't test because I didn't think to test it at the time. But like, what happens if you lose your caching layer and all the traffic starts suddenly uh, going directly to the database? Can you handle a sudden surge to the database? What happens if your PayPal API starts to slow down? Do you time out and retry? Or do you just wait there and let the user wait on, for the request? So you should really test for failures because uh, at some point you learn that uh, life is imperfect, and at some point, everyone's going to fail, and you know, hardware eventually will always fail, and software eventually will work. So you should test for those failures. Okay, so some best practices, and then we'll recap and close it out. Um, treat performance as a feature. I really can't emphasize this enough. Um, it, you know, it doesn't really matter what industry, if you're building a call center application, um, people who call in and have to wait on hold while somebody types and looks for some frequently asked question, uh, it impacts the business. If you're an e-commerce application and you click checkout and you wait five seconds, people start to lose faith in your e-commerce store. So treat performance as a feature. Capacity plan and load test the server side. Understand um, on launch day what to expect. Optimize and performance test the client side because you'll get more gains on the client side than you will on the server side. If the server is available, um, but you're still sending a bunch of slow JavaScript to the front end, you're still going to be waiting in the browser. The application's still not going to be usable. So make sure you test for that. And then understand your starting point. You can't understand the delta or the change unless you know where you're starting from. So instrument everything and monitor performance and development and production. So, Again, if you're only doing it in production, and by the five people who raise their hand who actually do some form of monitoring in production, you should really be doing it in development too. Not just using Xdebug to profile your code, but understanding how the performance affects each transaction. And then measure the difference of every change. Every code deployment, every time you upgrade PHP, every time you upgrade MySQL, insert some new service, add a third-party dependency, it impacts performance. So be under, have an understanding of exactly how performance changes from release to release. In order to do that, automate performance testing as part of your build and deployment process. This is something you shouldn't have to manually do every time. You should write the stuff once and then just automate it from that point forward. All the tools that I've talked about can be plugged in very easily into Jenkins or Travis CI so that it happens as part of your commit process or commit and build process. And then again, understand how failures impact performance. Life is an imperfect, it's an imperfect world and at some point things will break so you might as well plan for it and understand how you fail. If you try to connect to memcache, do you have a, a, a low timeout or are you just gonna sit there and wait forever? Do you use uh, PayPal's API or Braintree's API or some uh, third party API? Understand what happens when that slows down. You know, you're not the only dependency in your application so you should understand how your third party dependencies impact you. 
So integrate automated performance testing into your continuous integration setup for both the server side and the client side. Understand the performance implications of every deployment and package upgrade, and monitor end user experience from end to end in production and in development. And that is all I have. So questions? Don't feel free to ask them all at once. Um, and then these slides are available on speakerdeck.com. I know I went through a lot of this content very fast and some at a very high level. Um, if you download this presentation, there are notes and for each one of these slides that fully explain how to get started with each one of these tools. So I like to cover a lot of information as fast as possible, um, but the depth is really in the notes. So feel free to check them out. Um, so, well, I would like to, to know your opinion about this. Uh, the things that um, uh, for um, profiling and testing and development and staying, it's quite all right. You are not affecting anyone else but you or uh, your own infrastructure, but not your clients. Uh, and sometimes you can uh, test a uh, lot of tests against uh, production without to, uh, you can choose some uh, span of time that you will have little amount of users, or you can just shut down for one hour that's right in the, uh, at midnight if you have only one time zone yeah. uh, uh, active users. Uh, but sometimes it's not that easy to do that. Uh, well, the problem is when you are testing against third parties, uh, for instance, you want to test an entire uh, circuit in which you are buying a product, and you have to go to a, uh, a payment pay, payway, and you you have to go, go back from that from that point. And uh, in a staging, it's all right, but yeah. the environment in a staging, the database probably is not the same. Uh, the amount of servers that you have in the staging is not the same than the one you have in production. Uh, probably in production, you have much more resources than the one that you have in staging. So how do you actually measure in production a, a real scenario? So one thing that I try to do is, um, if you have some sort of configuration management tool, like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, whatever your flavor is, um, if you live in a cloud environment, it becomes very cheap to spin up a full production cluster in a staging environment. Most third parties offer some form of a sandbox. So the, if you're using Braintree's API, you can use the Braintree dev sandbox to run tests against. In cases where that's not realistic, what you should do is you should mock out those dependencies and introduce um, introduce latency, introduce failures um, manually. Uh, you will always have the problem of how do I load test in production. Uh, the best thing I can offer is make your staging environment exactly like production. Make it the same data volumes, the same levels of concurrency, the same backend providers. Um, it's not always possible. And with a lot of applications, uh, the best thing that you can do is work with your third party vendors to come up with a time that it's acceptable to load test their endpoints or oftentimes they do that on their behalf anyways, and you just want to understand what concurrency, what's the SLA that you can expect from them. Um, yeah, unfortunately there's no great answer. What I try to do is spin up an entire production environment, import the entire database, the entire production setup and staging, and just spin it up for a couple of hours while we load test, so you can understand where the failures are. Um, when you do that, you can reproduce most common failures, but there will always be the edge cases that you don't see until you get to pr production, and that's where the monitoring becomes really valuable because you don't want to just wait till you have exceptions and things start to time out. You want to get alerted or you want to get informed somehow when the latencies start to increase. That way you can be proactive about it and instead of waiting till it's totally failed. No. Hey there, Dustin. Thanks Hi. for the talk. Thank you. Um, this w w websites these days rely a lot of on tracking, a lot of tools for tracking, like Google Analytics, uh, uh, a bunch of retargeting, uh, and all those, those yeah. sort of tools. Uh, do you know anything that uh, you can use to proactively monitor those third parties, so you get an alert when some one of them is misbehaving or even shut them down if they are uh, harming the customer experience? Yeah, um, so I don't want this to sound like a plug for my company, but <laughs> AppDynamics does offer resource timing APIs. If you go to webpagetest.org, um, and if you use something like episodes, it's very easy to understand um, third-party assets and how long they're taking. So um, you can use this with AppDynamics. You can roll up your own approach with uh, Boomerang or episodes. And what it'll do is it'll instrument the client side. Uh, and what you'll see is, hey, these domains are taking a long time to resolve. Or, hey, Twitter.com is down, and I can't load the Twitter social widget. And that's blocking my entire front-end experience. 
Now the best practice for all these uh, third party widgets is to make them asynchronous and make sure that they happen after the page load is, uh, after the application is actually available. That's why a lot of times you'll see the page become available and then you see the social widgets being added for that exact reason. If you use something like Mixpanel for event tracking or Google Analytics or uh, PeeWeeKey or whatever analytics solutions, they all follow the same approach for that exact reason. Thanks. Yep. Dustin, you mentioned um, plugging most of those tools into Jenkins um, in a CI environment. Mm -hmm. What sort of feedback um, are you recommending that, that Jenkins give? Is it simply a fail that there was some line that was crossed or archiving the results into some sort of long-term tracking? Um, usually what I do is I take those result, results and I dump them into some sort of time series database so I can understand when I did a deployment what, what, what latency changed in between. But generally what you just build is a test report and it's a visual output. So that's why I recommend SiteSpeed. SiteSpeed, that dashboard, just becomes a build artifact that you can just view and see, okay, here's what, here's, um, here's what changed in the last build. Um, and then you can write tests and assertions based on that. So you can set those thresholds where it's like, hey, if we have any number of static assets that are not being cached or don't have caching headers, I wanna get an alert and have the build fail because there's a misconfiguration there. Um, if I have any page that takes over some 100 milliseconds or whatever is reasonable for that page, I want that to fail the build because there's a performance problem there. Um, that's a bit more evolve, uh, involved to configure and maintain, um, but that's where you get the most value. Yeah. Thanks. Anything else? Um, yeah, I guess I just had a question about the cost of, uh, you know, instrumentation. I mean, you say you instrument everything, but obviously there's going to be a point where you get diminishing returns. Do you have any kind of ideas about how much is too much? Um, you know, how, when to apply these tools and when not to? When do you, the overheads? Yeah, um, you know, it greatly depends. Um, on the client side, because it's a shared resource, it's not a shared resource, every browser is independent of another, it's easier to ignore some of the... Um, overhead that's associated with, say, adding um, some JavaScript tracking with Boomerang or episodes. Um, when it comes to the server side, uh, oftentimes that's where you introduce a lot of overhead to do that level of instrumentation. Um, I don't have any hard and fast rules. What I'd say is all relative to the value that you get out of it. Um, I find it very useful to use something like StatsD. StatsD is non-blocking, so I can go and push a ton, I can collect the metrics in real time and then push them to StatsD after the request is being handed off to the user so there's no actual impact to the end user experience. Mm. Um, generally recommend that approach. Not, uh, if you use APM tools uh, like New Relic or AppDynamics or Dynatrace, uh, what you'll find is that uh, they all really focus on having low overhead. Yeah. And that's exactly why, because you don't want to, be, you don't want to have to spend another $10,000 on hardware um, just because you want some visibility into what's happening in production, so you need to be aware of that. But most of them focus uh, quite a bit on being, you know, one or two percent overhead. Yep. And what about developer time, like the cost of implementing these in throughout your code base? Yeah, so uh, most of the stuff that I talk about, you can do in under a day. So uh, it's one thing where you invest up front, uh, and then it becomes automated. Um, depending on the level, the granular detail that you want, um, it, it can add up. The goal is to abstract it. So if you're using Guzzle, um, you can have Guzzle dump the timings for every single third-party HTTP service call. If you're using the memcached um, extension, you can have it dump the timings for every memcached lookup. Um, oftentimes, the best thing to do is pull these stats directly from the service. So pull the latency for the request from Nginx stats API directly instead of trying to track it just on the PHP side. So almost all these services have some form of a stats API, whether it's Nginx, memcached, Redis, Postgres, RabbitMQ, et cetera, um, where you can pull that data directly. Cool. Yeah, I generally recommend that versus trying to capture it all at runtime because of the performance overhead. Anything else? Um, I think most of these tools um, are still very uh, desktop specific. Um, do you have any recommendations for testing client side performance on a mobile device? So real native mobile apps are incredibly difficult to test. Um, the only company I've seen done a, that does a great job at this is Appium. They basically have uh, many real devices that you can run uh, actual native apps on. Um, there's a couple of frameworks that allow you to do this stuff, but nothing really in production. Um, 
Again, most of the APM tools have some, some form of a mobile component where you can add their SDK and they'll capture the interaction timings on a mobile device. Uh, but no, nothing that will do this at high levels of concurrency. The best way that I find to test um, real mobile applications and the impact to the server side is to, to mock a client that does user scenarios and just replicate the REST API calls that they would make and then test that at high volumes. But you're only going to test the server side interaction and oftentimes the most valuable thing to find out is, hey, what happens when I run this app on iOS 5.1 on iPhone 5? Right? And I do that on a slow 3G connection versus I do that on a fast Wi-Fi connection. And the best uh, tool that I found for that is Appium, A-P-P-I-U-M. Um, it's a commercial tool. They have like a free tier, I believe, um, but that's the most complete solution that I found for this specific problem. Um, the alternative option is um, you can do uh, Square, I believe, uh, wrote a library. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but I'll follow up. Um, that essentially allows you to do functional testing for iOS applications. And then what you can do is you can build your own sort of mobile test center where you have a bunch of devices connected to an Xcode build server. Um, but that's very expensive and it's not really scalable for most people. But that's what I find the uh, companies with a lot of resources is generally what they end up doing. So they just have hundreds of devices connected to a gigantic build server that fire off these scenarios. But it's extremely expensive. All right, thanks. thanks. All right, I think we're out of time, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out on Twitter or email me at dustin.whittle at gmail.com. Thank you very much for having me, and thanks to the organizers for an excellent event. Cheers.